Okay, welcome everyone. Very exciting speaker today. Uh, uh, for all of you, I bet a bunch of you are in sales, is that correct? Don't be too, I know there's a formula at the top of this book. Don't be too intimidated. Mark will go over it, so don't worry about that. Uh, and this is Google after all, so I think this is a very appropriate talk about how to use data to drive sales. Uh, Mark Roberge from HubSpot is here to, to talk about his book. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm not sure if you guys know, I'm Rich Miner from Google Ventures. We actually invested in HubSpot uh, several years ago and rode that through its uh, initial public offering, and that's when I first met Mark. Uh, today, HubSpot's trading at about $1.6 billion. Mark was employee number four, started the sales there after graduating from uh, MIT Sloan, and that was his first sales job, which he'll talk about. Um, and he grew it from uh, basically zero dollars in sales to over 100 million and, and to where it is today. And so without further ado, I will let Mark hop up on stage and tell his story. Thanks, Rich. Thanks, guys, for having me out. Thank you, Rich. Uh, one of my favorite things about coming to Google is I love using Google Maps to find Google. <laughs> it's like you guys need to have like a take me to your master button just to make that like super straightforward. Um, but uh, awesome to be here. Um, you know, it's been great getting to know Rich over the years and kind of watching the HubSpot journey. Um, as he mentioned, um, I met one of our co-founders, uh, Darmesh, sitting next to him in class at MIT. He had this business idea about HubSpot. He invested in a startup that I was doing. As part of that deal, he asked that I help him out one day a week. And that was kind of my venture into HubSpot. Uh, decided to join full time and, and uh, joined as the fourth employee. Scaled up sales and service to about 425 employees and got the company to about 100 million in revenue. In the last two years, I've been working on getting us into the sales product arena, which I can talk to about during the Q&A. But it's that first journey that I'm gonna tell you about today. What people get a kick out of the story is, as Rich mentioned, I've never been in sales before. This was my first sales job. Um, probably like many of you, um, I studied engineering undergrad. Um, I started my career at Accenture back in the late 90s, writing Java and, and you know, et cetera and I have a degree from MIT, um, which tends to be quant-based. So my professional world has always been viewed through this lens of data and technology and science. And it was that lens that I used to kind of challenge some of the norms of traditional sales execution. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. So when I took the, wor the role, um, really my, my mission was predictable, scalable revenue growth. Um, if some of you ever decide to go and found your own company and do a, a series A or a seed funded pitch to a guy like Rich, write these four words on the screen, they all love it. Like scribble it down, that's what we want too. Um, so that's a good place to start. There were four tactics that I used to, uh, to achieve that mission. The first one was how can I hire the same successful salesperson every single time? The second was how can I trade them in a very predictable way? The third was how could I provide them with the same quality and quantity of leads every single month? And the fourth was how could I hold them accountable to the same sales process against those leads? And I figured if I could achieve those four tactics, I'd have a high degree of, of likelihood of succeeding against my mission. And these are the four sections we'll talk about today. All right, so hiring. And I typically stop here and ask the audience, you know, what do you look for in a salesperson? Or if you were to hire a salesperson as a, as a founding entrepreneur, what would you look for? And I do that um, because the audience has no clue what they're talking about. Um, in this case, I'm very envious of the very scientific approach that Google takes. So maybe I'll, I'll pose that question in, in the hopes of even maybe learning something here. But are there sales? I know Rosenthal is a hiring manager here. Are there other hiring managers in the audience for sales? So just what do you guys look for in, in sales hiring? Good. Process oriented. And how do you look for that in the interview process briefly? Uh, we have them describe a situation or a situation. Cool. Yeah, we tease that out. How they approach problem solving. You want to give me one more? That's a good one. I love that. Go ahead. General business sense. Give them a business challenge like starting a company and hear how they think. And yep. Especially if it's something they haven't thought about before, just to kind of hear the level of thinking. Yep, I love that. So we had business sense for the video there and we had process oriented there. I love those. So let me uh, tell you a little bit about a story uh, that I had. So when I first uh, went out and hired folks, um, 
I think it was the seventh hire I made in uh, 2008. And I was able to nab the number one salesperson from an 800 person sales team here, here in Boston. It wasn't Google. Uh, it was a public company. And uh, I was psyched. I, I had somehow had convinced them that we were going to be the next uh, big deal in town. And they decided to come over. And I was surprised that that person did not crush it at our company. I thought they would. I thought they would come in and completely teach us how to sell. And as I stood back and thought about it and reflected on that situation, I realized that they came from such a different context than where we were selling. Right? They came from this enormous brand. They picked up the phone. People knew exactly wh what was coming in terms of the pitch. It was a very transactional sale. It was usually sort of like a, a same call decision. And they would do as much activity as problem that led to success. That couldn't have been more different than the context that we were selling at HubSpot in the early days. Right? No one had a clue who we did, who we were. We told them we were selling inbound marketing software. They had no idea what inbound marketing was. It was a very evangelistic, consultative sell. And it, it made me understand that when, when hiring managers and when entrepreneurs ask me, well, what do you look for in a salesperson? It's almost like in, an irrelevant question because it so depends on their unique context and how complex their sale is, who they're selling to, et cetera. So that was my first takeaway is the ideal sales hiring formula is different for every company. However, I do think that there is a consistent process on how that formula can actually be engineered. And I think this is something that you guys do exceptionally well. And it's something that I, you know, I just, using my, my engineering background, kind of instinctively try, try to go this in terms of predicting success. So the first year I wrote down the 10 criteria that I thought would correlate with success in our environment, I clearly defined what each criteria was. I clearly defined what a score of a 1 to 3 or a 5 to 7 or a, you know, 8 to 10 would look like. And I was disciplined about scoring every single hire against that criteria. And the nice thing about sales, unlike engineering and, and uh, marketing and other disciplines, is it's probably the most um, quantitative function where you can quantify success. And by following this process, it allowed me to reflect on the first six hires, the first 12 hires that I made, and start to pick up patterns as to what's predicting success and what's not, and iterate on that, uh, that approach. And it wasn't long, probably about 18 months in, where as a young startup, I was able to do a regression analysis against uh, predicting success and attainment rate and, and, and revenue success and that kind of stuff with the criteria that I was actually observing during the interview process. Um, so this is the results of the first regression analysis that I did. And this evolved a little bit um, from where we ended up. What was really interesting about this was some of the criteria that you typically associate with a good salesperson, maybe in sort of like a car sales environment, something we think is a traditional sales environment, like closing ability, uh, convincing, objection handling. Those were actually negatively correlated with success in our model. And things that you would associate with like a great consultant uh, or a coach, like preparation and domain experience and intelligence, those were most highly correlated. So I was really, I thought this was a really cool outcome that there's been a lot of chat about how the buyer behaviors change and sales needs to change and all that kind of stuff. And this was some form of statistical uh, you know, proof that the buyers wanted a different type of salesperson that was less the person that was jamming concepts down your throat and more someone that they could trust, respect, get advisement from, and appreciate through the sales process. So there were five criteria over time in our context um, that correlated with success. And I do, um, I do believe that in a lot of tech entrepreneurship um, situations, these five criteria um, actually correlate pretty well. I'll poll you guys to see how you do here. So these three are all in the top five. Uh, one of them is number one, obviously. So how many think uh, intelligence is the number one correlating criteria in our environment? How about coachability? How about curiosity? OK, cool. I got you. Curiosity was number two. Uh, coachability was actually number one. And what was really interesting about that was coachability wasn't even in my first um, set of the 10 criteria that I laid out. It, it didn't come until like a year later when I looked and saw some people who were absolutely just crushing it, uh, or absolutely like crushing their last job, but they weren't doing well here. And they were the types of folks that just like 
they locked themselves in the room and kind of weren't open to the training and the coaching. They were like, you know what, I know how to sell. I've been selling for 10 years. Let me just go figure it out. And they were the folks that actually ended up failing. So it's something that we had to really uh, you know, get out in the interview process. So there are coachability, curiosity, intelligence, work ethic, and prior success. And if there's curiosity on, on how I interview on that, on that, we can talk about that during the Q&A. So moving on to training. Um, what I found with training was um, I first uh, interviewed like 30 VPs of sales when I took this job in the first year because I didn't know what the heck I was doing and I'd never done this before. And I learned some stuff from that process, um, but I also found some things that I didn't like about the process and training was certainly one of them. Um, it seemed like when I asked folks, how do you train your salespeople? They said, hey, you know, Bob, welcome to the company. You remember Sue, our number one salesperson from the interview process? Well, you're going to sit next to her for two months, or you're going to ride with her for two months. And that didn't feel scalable nor predictable for me. Um, so I wanted to challenge that and kind of create some, a much more predictable, you know, exam oriented, certification oriented approach, which we did. We introduced a sales methodology, and that was very important. Um, what I found was, over the years, as I looked at our top performing salespeople, each salesperson that was a top performer was kind of a different top was a, a top performer for a different reason. Um, like I had this guy Adam, who was an absolute activity hound. Every time we generated our monthly reports, he had 40% more activity than everybody else. He would just crush the phones. If you went and sat behind him at his desk, he had like five tabs or of his CRM open, he was on the phone, he was writing emails, he was taking notes, he was a multitasker, he was insane. And he was like mediocre at everything else. He wasn't the best consultative seller, he didn't build the best trust with his prospects, he didn't do the best discovery calls, but because he had 40% more activity than everybody else, huge numbers came out the bottom. And then I had Jen, and Jen was an amazing rapport builder, right? Like you listen to her demos, the first half hour was about sports and kids and church and the weather and she was best friends with every prospect that she spoke, spoke to. Now again, didn't give the best product demo, didn't uh, give the best discovery calls, but because her prospect loved her so much, many, many of them bought. Now, they were both top performing reps. Imagine if Jen trained by watching Adam or Adam trained by watching Jen. It would have, they would have had picked up bad habits, they would have had different perception of their unique superpowers and whether they could use their superpowers in our environment, and I see that happen time and time again. So that's another reason where I really wanted to strive toward this sort of standard process. Now beyond that, in training, uh, there were two opportunities that we, we took advantage of. One was um, because the buyers have a higher expectation from sales and want to learn from them, we thought it was absolutely critical that we strive in training to put our salespeople into the seats, the professional seats of their buyers as best we could. So in our example, every single HubSpot salesperson um, spends a good deal of their 30-day training building their own website and their own blog on the HubSpot software. They generate a social media following of 100 plus followers for this mini business that they start. They rank in Google for dozens of words. They set up uh, landing pages and run A-B tests. They generate an email following and nurture those emails. Um, they set up uh, a, a, an analytics platform so that they can actually measure the conversion rates between each one. Uh, and by the time they're done with that training, they can actually school 90% of the marketers that they're going to speak with on the phone. And so I think that's a big opportunity that we, I'd like to see more companies do is go beyond just the typical product training and try to get these folks engaged in the day-to-day -day lives they are better sellers. The other opportunity that we had um, was there's an opportunity for the salespeople to build up their own personal brand and trust within the, within the ecosystem, right? So many corporations and brands are doing a better job on their content marketing strategy and their inbound marketing strategy these days and trying to come up more uh, organically, whether it's in search or social media discussions, that same opportunity exists for the sales people. And I encourage our, um, you know, our, our sales people, and even when I go out and meet other uh, sales people, and they'll talk to me, and they're like, you know, Mark, I, I cold call 50 hours a month in order to generate demand for myself and my, my company. And I say, you know, that's the reality. It's a sales job. You need, to, you need to cold call. But here's what I'd like you to do. 
next month spend 40 hours a month cold calling and use that 10 hours a month that you saved and actually um, participate online where your prospects are actually conversing, right? So what blogs are your prospects following? Read those blogs, comment on those blogs, right? In fact, submit a guest post for your blog if you have a corporate blog. What LinkedIn groups are your prospects a part of? Get involved in those LinkedIn, group, LinkedIn groups and answer those questions, right? Um, on Twitter, who do they follow on Twitter? Follow those same people and retweet their stuff and you'd be surprised that those people start following you. And then do that for two months and then ask yourself, were those 10 hours a week, a month, spent better cold calling or were they spent better participating in social media? What kind of action did that stir up for you? And I think most salespeople find that that was a really productive uh, process and they may actually double down on those efforts. So there's certainly an opportunity out there for salespeople themselves to set themselves up with the, as thought leaders, and that's something that can be incorporated into training as well. Okay. Third section, um, same quality and quantity of leads. Um, how many people in the last six months have received a cold call, either at your office or at your, at your home, and you got into this engaging conversation with a telemarketer, and you ended up buying the product they were selling? It's usually like one, like a timeshare or something like that. I don't know. Like, I had one that called me. He said, um, do you have a crack in your windshield? I said, no, and they just hunt up. That's what, that's what these people, people are doing these jobs. I don't, I don't know why they do this. But how many people in the last six months have received a piece of direct mail or an unsolicited email to your inbox? You opened it, you were intrigued, and you ended up buying the product. What was it? Close. Okay, you're fired from Google. You're not. You're not supposed to do this. So that's that's cool. It's unique to find that amongst those audience, but that's cool. What what did, what brand was it? They get me too. I always get the catalogs and stuff. I'd rather not say. Okay, that's cool. <laughs> I'm a big fan of Pistol Lake these days. Kind of like the startup hoodie thing going on, but uh, yeah, you don't have to tell me. How many people in the last six months have gone to Google to do a search or out into social media? Um, to do some research on a product, and that research led to you buying a product. Okay, so you know the folks in this room has probably had the biggest influence of any company on this trend, uh, but this is the reality of the buying journey that we're dealing with today, is uh, buyers have complete empowerment, and uh, they don't have to go to trade shows, they don't have to deal with these interruptive outbound marketing, as we call it. They can be in their bunny slippers on a Saturday night doing research after the kids are asleep, making business decisions and choosing the vendors they're going to do business with. And what's really interesting and still an opportunity for us and, and obviously a huge one that you guys continue to take advantage of is when you go back and re-survey um, most audiences and ask them where are they spending their sales and marketing budgets, how much are they spending on trade shows and interruptive advertising and cold calling versus how much are they putting into content and the efforts that can attract people to their businesses, there's still a huge disproportion to the buyer behavior that we just proved out in that survey and proves out time and time again. And that's a big opportunity, obviously, that we've always tried to push is, is this inbound marketing message, leaning into content. And um, the, um, the thing that most uh, businesses don't recognize is the importance of content development and the journalist role in that. I was actually just speaking to a, a startup uh, on the way here, um, down in New York. 100 people starting to build out their marketing team. And it amazes me to this day that it knocks them off their seat when I tell them that our second hire in our marketing team, when we were only 20 people, was a journalist from the New York Times. And that's really how a lot of these marketing teams need to be thinking is it's less about these folks who have product marketing backgrounds and, and uh, trade show booth skills or direct mail skills and that kind of stuff. And it's more about people who can just speak to a neurologist um, with a very deep PhD uh, you know, and, and great knowledge in a space that they know nothing about and actually take from that hour long cup of coffee a beautiful piece that layman folks can understand. I mean, that's what a great journalist can do. And that person and that skill set plays an enormous role in marketing teams today and plays an enormous role in the demand generation formula for, for many businesses. Um, the great thing about that is um, it's not a great time to be a journalist these days in a traditional manner. Um, 
the newspapers and magazines are not exactly doing well, and uh, these folks are far less expensive than, uh, than a programmer um, and far easier to find. Um, so not even they know that they hold the keys to the future of sales and marketing, so uh, we, we hope to see more companies take advantage of that. And the process that we like to see is once you find that journalist, they don't have to necessarily have domain experience in the business um, that they're working in. That's really the job of the business. The CEO, the C-suite, the salespeople usually have great uh, knowledge of the domain because they're talking to prospects all the time. So when you find that journalist, coupling them with a few dozen or dozens of thought leadership folks, a committee within the organization is advantageous. And they can sit down once a week for an hour with one thought leader and they can interview them and produce a five page ebook and produce three or four blog posts and produce a few dozen social media messages um, that they can actually schedule over the course of a month from that one interview. And those, blog, you know, those social media messages go out over the course of, of a month, they point back to the relevant blog articles, and most importantly, at the end of each blog article is a call to action that says, did you like this blog article in XYZ? Perhaps you'd like the five page ebook that we wrote. And that is yours for free. We just need your name, phone number, email address, and company, and you can have it. And that simple process that didn't put a big burden on the executive leadership team, the sales team, the engineering team for content development, really specialized it in someone who can do that very well, uh, creates a huge following in Google, lots of great organic traffic coming to the website, a really high conversion rate uh, from visit to lead on your website, and a nice stream of quality leads for the sales team. Um, so this is done very well for organizations. Um, the other thing that comes up a lot is um, aligning marketing and sales, especially at sort of that mid-market company level, something that we went through and a lot of our customers go through as well. And you know, a lot of the companies that we go and visit, we find that marketing and sales has traditionally not gotten along. I don't know if, if you guys have gone through that. Uh, at some point, you probably did. Um, what I find often is that marketers feel that their salespeople are overpaid, spoiled brats and the salespeople feel that marketers do arts and crafts all day. And that's the reality of that relationship. And then they go back to their respective corners of the office and, and do their cold calls and do their trade show booths and branding exercises and, and there's dysfunction. And that dysfunction is sort of the kiss of death in today's mar modern organization when so many buy-in journeys start online and need to be eloquently passed off to the salesperson. So this alignment is really, really critical and something that we worked hard on in sort of quantifying. So that's the first step is we created this sales and marketing SLA, service level agreement, where we quantified the deliverables from marketing to sales and sales to marketing. Right? So as an example, we knew in the first year or two of our business that for a mid-market salesperson, if we gave them 100 inbound leads a month, that they would uh, connect with half create 30 sales opportunities, do 15 demos, and close five customers for roughly $800 monthly recurring revenue per customer. And that, those, that math worked very well. So if we had 10 mid-market salespeople, each needing 100 leads a month, it was very easy to define that SLA of 1,000 a uh, mid-market qualified sales leads for that team, and that was the journey that marketing had to follow. Sounds really good, and if I found a company that did that, I would say, great, you're in the top 5% of your peers in terms of the sales and marketing alignment journey. However, even that sophistication created misalignment. And what happened was um, we counted a VP of marketing who came to our website and requested a demo as a qualified lead. That was beautiful, right? We also counted a VP of marketing from a mid-market company that downloaded a white paper as a qualified lead. That's a great lead. Now, any guesses as to which one closed at a higher rate? The demo request or the white paper download? Demo request, it was about three times higher. And which one is easier for marketing to generate? To get a visitor to request a demo or to get them to download a white paper, right? So even though we were pr pretty sophisticated in our approach, it still created a misalignment and sure enough, as the month or quarter unfolded, and the marketing team fell behind in their SLA, all the calls to actions on the website moved from demo requests to white paper downloads. And the sales team was like, what happened to those beautiful demo requests? So 
Mike Volpe, our CMO, and I sat back and thought about it, and we, we started studying the lead flow. And um, let's take the mid-market example in the upper right. Um, we studied you know, tens of thousands of leads that were at the problem education stage. They had downloaded white papers. And those converted to customers at 2%, and when they bought software from us, they spent $200,000. I made these numbers up, but you get the point. Um, versus if someone went all the way down to the solution research stage and requested a demo, well, they would close at three times the rate. They'd close at 6%, and again, would spend $200,000 when they bought software. So we simply multiplied the conversion rate times the average revenue per customer, and that got us a lead value. So now, um, uh, you know, white paper downloads were worth $4,000, and demo requests were worth six, were worth 12. And now I was in a position to tell marketing, I no longer need 1,000 mid-market leads from you a month. I need you know, $700,000 of lead value. And whether you get there through you know, whatever the math is, you know, 1,000 or so of the white paper downloads or 3,000 or so of the demo requests, that's up to you. And this is a very, very effective concept and a cool concept when you think, we put marketing on a revenue quota just like sales and that kind of accountability month to month. And suddenly, literally the next week, all the calls to actions on the website went to demo requests and it was great. Sales loved them, more qualified leads, and marketing was getting the appropriate credit for the hard work they were doing in driving that quality lead. Now, sales does not get off the hook with this process. Um, they're equally accountable. And what I would do is I'd ask questions like, okay, when I get a qualified lead, I know we should call it right away. I know we should call it, but, but like, if I do get voicemail, do I call it this afternoon again, or next, tomorrow, or next week, or when should I try it again, and how many times should I try it before I give up? And as a sales leader, should I give each salesperson one lead a month and have them call it a thousand times, or give them a thousand leads a month and have them call them once each? So obviously, like the right answer is somewhere in between, but where is that right answer? So another study, to give you some examples of some of this stuff, so uh, you know, stuff that you guys do quite well as, as well, is here you've got an, uh, the x-axis is the number of attempts we made against these leads. Some were only attempted twice, some were attempted 12 times. And the y-axis is the profitability um, of those efforts. Because clearly when you call something more frequently, your likelihood to get on the phone is higher, but it costs you more in terms of your pursuit of that account. So wherever we could maximize these behaviors in terms of profitability, that was the right answer. So the orange line was uh, the small business leads, and that maxed out at around five attempts. The blue line was the mid-market, that maxed out around eight attempts, and the black line was 12 uh, attempts. Uh, tw the black line was the enterprise leads, and that maxed out at 12 attempts. So now I could go to the sales team and say, guys, we have calculated the behavior to making the most money here at HubSpot. And that's what salespeople like to hear, right? And guys, we program this into the CRM. You don't even have to think about it. You go, you call a lead. Um, the CRM automatically notes that call and puts that lead away and brings it back the next time it should call. And each night, we're gonna have a report that goes out to make sure that nothing's falling through the cracks. And, that, and, and salespeople kind of like that too. If you start with a very data-driven culture, they like the fact that this is my lead flow and I want to make sure I'm, I'm optimizing the revenue from that lead flow and I'm glad that the system checks it for me. So each night, a report went out to the whole sales team, the whole marketing team, me, our CEO, and it showed if any of these behaviors were not being followed by the sales team so we could act immediately. And it also showed where we were on this marketing SLA so the marketing team was accountable. So we were able to manage that demand gen handoff on a daily basis to make sure that we had the right demand feeding into the team and to make sure that that demand was being acted on appropriately by the sales folks and we were intervening immediately if it wasn't. So that, that helped us out quite a bit. Okay, last section, I'll uh, move to um, the, the, the questions. Uh, so um, managing salespeople and holding them accountable to the same sales process, um, I wish we could rename the sales management title to the sales coaches. Um, because I think that's the most important thing that sales managers can do is coach and develop, and develop their salespeople. And the best and simplest example I can give and what I see as effective coaching is, comes from my pursuit of the game of golf, which has not been a very successful pursuit um, today. 
But um, I've taken many lessons. And uh, one golf pro said, Mark, take a swing. And I did. And he said, OK, turn your grip over a little bit. Lean back in your stance. Put more weight on your right foot, not your left. Think 1 o'clock, not 2 o'clock on your backswing. And turn your wrist over more when you contact the ball. And I was like, you got to be kidding me, right? The next golf pro was like, all right, Mark, take a swing. And I did. And he said, all right, turn your ripple, grip over a little bit. Now take 100 swings. I did that for 20 minutes. And he said, how's that feel? So yeah, I can feel it. That feels good. So now start leaning back in your stance a little bit. Take another 100 swings. How's that feel? It's right, so a really simple example, but I have promoted 17 sales managers at HubSpot. Every single one falls into the trap of the first golf pro, where they get a new salesperson, and they see the 90 things that are broken with them of where they are today and where they want them to be, and they sh throw up on them for an hour with feedback. And you can just see the rep's head spinning, and they don't know where to start. And the best sales managers and the coaches can actually see the 90 things, but focus on the one or two that are going to make the biggest impact today. And they decipher and diagnose that through metrics. And I call that metrics-driven sales coaching. And let me show you an example of how that works. So here's a, a really simple sales funnel. In the very uh, upper left, um, you've got how many leads each uh, rep worked, uh, how many they, they generated, then how many they worked, how many demos they delivered, and how much revenue they closed. The different colors are different salespeople in a given month. And on the right-hand side, you've got the conversion rates between each. Right? So just uh, you know, throw out some, some examples here. Like, Let's look at the top person in purple. Right? So if you were their sales manager, be a brave soul here and tell me, what would your coaching diagnosis be here? What do you see in their activity, and where are they broken in the sales process? Yeah, low revenue. Demos, lower demos than when you look at who's coming in with the most revenue. So potentially if they focus more of their time doing demos, a little less of their time doing leads worked. Yes. So really finding the ones that are working well for them. Yes. Transitioning those to demos quicker, yep. so they might get more revenue. Right, so she said um, maybe a little less focus working leads, a little more demos, and that could get the higher revenue. I think that's a good diagnosis. And what's interesting, whenever I go to a non-metrics-driven manager, they all, whenever they have an underperforming rep, they usually say, it's an activity problem. And they just need to do more activity. And in this case, that's far from tru the truth. This per person in purple at the top is doing the most activity. They're sourcing the most leads. They're doing the second most calls on the team. But they're really bad at getting them to the demo stage. And they're really bad at converting them to revenue. And so we've got two problems we have to work on. We have to work on getting prospecting demand to the demo stage. And we have to work on closing demos to customers. And I personally like to start as high in the funnel as I see a problem. Um, I can work on the demo, but I just don't feel like we have enough at-bats, as you pointed out. Um, so I need to look at their, the leads they're working and their effectiveness at getting to the demos. And my first question always is, can I learn more from the data by double-clicking? And in this case, I can in this simple example. So it's either that they are working lots of leads but not getting them on the phone, in which case I will see a lower connect rate in the upper right-hand corner, or it's that they're getting them on the phone but they are terrible at breaking the ice and getting them to move forward in the sales process, in which case I would show a deficiency in the bottom right chart. And this is an important uh, analysis because my coaching is going to be very, very different depending on my finding. If I find that their connect rate's low, I have to look at the frequency of their voicemails and emails and the effectiveness of that, et cetera. If they're getting them on the phone but just can't move to the next stage of the process, that's not the problem. The pro I have to listen to their connect calls and see how they're building trust and breaking the ice and getting these folks to and aligning their particular goals with moving forward in the sales process. Right, so there's you know, an example of metrics driven sales coaching, uh, very, very important for us in our growth. And, and uh, you know, the more companies can lean into this, I think it's effective in developing that sales staff. OK. So yeah, the book is there if you guys have grabbed your copies. The one note I want to make there, um, it did hit number one in, in Amazon for the sales category, which we're psyched about. But uh, all the proceeds go to uh, build.org. Is anyone involved in build here? Uh, I just actually did their. Um, business plan contest uh, this Saturday. And what Bill does is, obviously, there's some tough neighborhoods uh, here in Boston. Uh, some kids were not born into the, the, the opportunities that we probably all were. 
And, um, uh, and what Bill does is exposes these kids and freshmen in, in high school um, and to entrepreneurship and mentors them on how to start their own company and does it for the four years of, uh, of high school. And uh, the kids from these neighborhoods, they probably have like a 50% graduation rate and maybe a 30% matriculation rate into college. And the kids that go through this program, I think have a, a 80%, a 99% graduation rate from high school and an 80% matriculation rate in college. So I'm, you know, I'm a passionate entrepreneur and to take entrepreneurship and add value to these types of environments is really cool. So an organization to check out, um, they've got an event coming up later this month called Tug, which is a, a competition amongst nerds on like volleyball and Nerf gun shooting and that kind of stuff. If you want to check that out, you guys are probably already involved. All right, that's my show. Any so questions? Uh, Super interesting and in all the, the data-driven approaches. One thing that a lot of us in the room do as salespeople here is large customer sales. Yes. Um, have you done any research, any science behind in-person meetings versus phone virtual meetings and any correlation between upselling and success in terms of how often to be in front of the customer? I haven't, you know, we didn't get as much into that. I know you guys, obviously that's a bigger driver uh, for you. We did move into like the corporate slash enterprise space in the last, uh, you know, couple of years. Um, the trend I'm seeing there obviously is, is a lot more satellite offices as opposed to putting people in, in the territory themselves. Um, but I haven't, I haven't seen that. You know, obviously like there's, there's a lot more leniency toward or, or openness from the buyer around uh, you know, buying virtually these days than say 10 years ago. And I think a lot of you know, companies that are starting out building sales teams are, especially when they hire a seasoned um, head of sales, uh, they probably don't take advantage of that as much as they could. But I, I'm sorry, I can't give you like, I, I don't have any data-driven approaches there. All right. Thanks. Yep. Hey, Mark, thanks for being here. Yep. My name is Heather, I'm a sales manager here. Yep. What is it like to have um, Google Ventures invest in you? What, did you, what was the process Total like? micromanagement, worst uh, <laughs> VC to work with, no. Uh, it's awesome. Uh, Rich is obviously has an amazing, the great thing about like Rich and I think the Google Ventures folks is um, they come with operational experience, right? They've been entrepreneurs before, they've had huge successes and those are the types of um, you know, investors I personally like to work with. There are some who are just more from the finance side and they're putting money to work and they might look at in front of LPs and that kind of stuff. Um, but, uh, um, you know, I like, I like it when they have those backgrounds and Rich and Google Ventures certainly falls into that. The other great thing is just you guys are such like a horsepower and, you know, to be able to have tapped into, um, you know, various resources here through that relationship has been great. Um, I'll be quite frank, like, it's more challenging to do that. Like, I have a lot of friends at Google and, you know, know Rich well, and, like, oftentimes they know just as much as you do who you should be talking to at the company. It's such, like, a monstrosity, so it's becoming more challenging over the years for the company to be able to help, um, you know, companies from that standpoint, but certainly, um, our ability to get in front of the right people, um, it, it's easier when it comes from a, a fellow Google employee than it does, you know, called from me. Yeah, so. and, and just a quick follow-up, like what kinds of resources were you able to tap into? I'm just um, in the beginning, really around like how to build a great engineering team. You know, just like some of the best practices on recruiting and that kind of stuff, that was really important for us. We sort of struggled with that in the first few phases of the business. Um, another example recently was like we've, we're making a big bet in the sales software arena and trying to go heavy into freemium. We started with a Chrome extension, just getting featured in the Chrome store, which was like huge for us in the first phase of our growth. So there has been, there's a dozen other examples, but those are the types of things that, that have been really helpful. Thanks. Yep. Hey, Mark. To do a lot of the stuff you mention in the book, you have to have your salespeople use CRM. Yep. Um, and I know a lot of salespeople don't like using yes. CRM. So can you give any strategies as to how to, and realistic strategies, yep. um, as to how to get a sales team to actually use it properly? Yeah, so you know, that's, that's been the last two years of my, my job, is, is taking us into uh, the sales software space. And this whole question is, the cornerstone of our thesis and entry, which is uh, most sales software has really been built for the sales leader. 
um, to do forecasts and pipeline reviews and, and that kind of stuff. And um, the salesperson has sort of been left out of the use case analysis. And as such, so many sales leaders are left in a situation where they're getting 30, 50% adoption and the original utility for the CRM purchase is out the window. Um, one thing that we did right from the beginning was we had a sales first, salesperson first mentality around the implementation of our CRM. So there has to be a very clear what's in it for them. Like I knew that I wanted to track the number of calls they were made and when they were happening and that kind of stuff. But I also knew if I told them to log that, uh, that wasn't going to happen. So um, by integrating it with the, you know, having the calls being initiated from the CRM, um, giving them the, the ability to use Gmail to craft their emails, but automatically logging those emails in the CRM, to have the CRM go out and find and, and uh, you know, add, append to each account data that can be found in social media and, uh, and online automatically. These are all examples of things that like the CRM should work for the salesperson, not the work, salesperson work for the, sales, for the CRM, right? So if you're an executive looking to increase, um, uh, you, you know, the, your usage of the CRM, you have to figure out like this really strong what's in it for the rep to drive that data collection. Mark, Danielle, uh, I work in the tech B2B vertical, so a lot of what you were talking about with like marketing SLA and sales yeah. SLA really hits home as a lot of our clients, like email marketing, are very lead gen focused. Yeah. Assuming that most of our clients aren't having kind of these conversations between sales leaders and marketing leaders in terms of like finding that right balance, any recommendations for us as kind of like consultative and mostly having the relationships on the marketing side to go in and broker some of those conversations and what kind of are the the points that would really hit home into getting them yep. to think more in that model, because I think yeah. it would really resonate well with some of our clients. Yeah, a couple things in there. One is um, uh, to try to attach the effort to a higher level business objective. Um, oftentimes going to the CEO or COO that oversees them can be really effective, because they're, the, they're kind of there to sort of um, manage that misalignment. And if you can get into their heads as to like, what's on the agenda for this quarter strategically, what's on the agenda for this year strategically, and how you can align getting sales and market alignment to solve that, then that will be more likely to be pushed through. Um, and the other thing is, you know, we have the same problem where we start with marketing, we try to get to sales. In a B2B environment, generically speaking, um, the sales leader politically tends to carry more weight than the marketing leader. Um, so you have a little bit of a disadvantage there, and the sales, leader is going to be less open to ideas that originate from marketing, right? So what's important for us is to sort of restart that conversation with the sales leader, not necessarily built on the foundation that the marketer has given us, but like just do it from like the marketer cares about like lead gen and visitors and awareness and conversion. The salesperson cares about like forecasts and, and, and hiring and, and you know, demand gen for their team and the quality of leads, et cetera. So just rehabbing that conversation with the VP of sales, almost restarting the, the sales process to understand their desires and then saying, well, so it sounds like if I could double lead flow and the quality in XYZ areas, this would be a very compelling situation for you next quarter, correct? Would you like my help in, in driving that? So kind of like reframing it around their terminology has worked well for us. Okay. Yeah. Like a lot of the marketing, like day to day people that we deal with, even when you ask them what their goals and what their incentives and where they're bonused on, it's number of leads, not quality of leads, and it's yeah. not driving through to that final revenue. Yeah, and the mistake that so many of our salespeople make is they feel like they've built trust and have this amazing champion internally with a marketer and leave it to them to go talk to the VP of sales or go talk to the CEO. And, you know, uh, don't mean to offend people in marketing, but like, they're in marketing for a reason. Like they're not used to selling. And that's really what it takes when you go to the CEO or you go to the VP of sales and you're trying to make a change. It's a sales job. And so our best bet as a sales team is to get that direct inter interface. And if the marketer doesn't have enough trust to give it to us, then we are a sales coach now. And we are like, how are you going to approach the CEO and want me to build a deck for you? And can I coach you through it? So these are the tactics that tend to work. Okay. Well, thank you. Yep. Hey, Mark, thanks for coming. Um, my, my question was more on context. And mm -hmm. so you look at these charts, and they're, they're beautifully simple. And, I, and I'm, yeah. I'm sure there's an enormous amount of work and insight that goes around them. But 
Um, what was missing for me, or at least the question I had, was sort of timeline, right? You were the fourth employee yes. at this company, which yeah. a startup has a very different you know, set of pressures than Google, right? Yep. Because you're trying to get to the next round of funding and, and, yeah. and sort of demonstrate your business model. But then you have like this enormous, enormously clear set of data which is related to CRM. So like w when you were building the infrastructure, what was the timeline? I mean, yeah. it's had to have been a while, right? Yeah. Uh, so you had to deal with years of frustration, probably not being able to answer the questions you, you wanted and, and maybe <clears> now you're there. Yep. But just Yeah, good, great journey? question. And uh, to be honest, like a lot of the context from the book skews toward the early years, um, uh, in this surprisingly, right? So you probably need to start this stuff earlier than you'd expect. And um, for example, in the hiring, literally I, I went through that exercise before my first interview uh, with, with candidates. And yes, you're not going to have a regression analysis on you know, your, your correlated uh, criteria after your first three hires and after your first six months in business. But the important thing is you're, you're thinking in the right way. Um, you're, you're going through that discipline, and you're setting yourself up for that, that analysis 18 months down the road. And even having made like four hires, say in the first quarter, and watching them perform for three or four months, you have something to work with. You can go back and, and look at that interview score sheet and, and reflect qualitatively and make some adjustments. Um, so that, that was useful. On the demand gen side with the SLA, um, you know, it doesn't take a whole lot to generate a few hundred leads a month. Um, it doesn't take a lot to, for a salesperson to make, or a sales team to make a thousand calls in a month. So you start sitting on some data relatively quickly, even in the early infancies of a, a company development. So good question on like timeline, um, but a lot of these things I, can, I think need to be worked on from day one, and I think this day and age, it's surprising how quickly uh, data-driven insights actually surface. Okay, thanks. Yep. Hey Mark, thanks, this, is, this has been very, very informative. Um, Question for you on the approach that you have with holding marketing against revenue targets from a demand gen standpoint. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's brilliant, and most of my clients are, they sell marketing SaaS, and none mm -hmm. of them do this. Yep. So they're behind the eight ball there. But yep. um, where I struggle with it is in the world of selling B2B SaaS, a lot happens before you pick up the phone and call someone or are ready to talk yep. to someone, let alone see a demo, right? Yep. So what happens when your mark so Mike's team yep. sends a forty dollar or four hundred dollar white paper yep. download lead over to a salesperson? Is that even ready or yep. do you further yep. bake it before yep. it gets there? Yeah, there's a there's a in sec, part three or something, there's a chapter on this on like the, the right times to hand off. And um, I don't I don't think I have that in the appendix here, but you'd have to imagine sort of a matrix of the y axis being the different types of companies, the demographics that really are static, they're not gonna change. It could be company size, it could be the industry that they're in. Um, and then the, the x-axis is the engagement, their journey down the buying journey. And so if there's some, let's say it's enterprise mid-market and small business, and let's say it's like you know low, low engagement and then really high engagement. Um, with the enterprise, um, like those are high value leads. I mean, the minute they touch our website, without even giving us a name, we should have someone calling them. Because we're probably cold calling to that group anyway, right? The mid-market, that might be more like the, when they give us an email and phone number, we should start calling them. The small business community, we want to drive them all the way through uh, inbound marketing education, product education, probably get them all the way to this group product wet demo. And whoever raises their hands after that will get a phone call. And that's very much kind of how we drive it. So, so you're kind of being very uh, aware of the, the opportunity size and the engagement cycle and, and differing that question based on those. And then you could have like mini, mini analysis within there. Like for example, in the, in the enterprise segment, well you can do another sort of buyer persona engagement level based on the role, right? So if it's like the VP of marketing, well heck, we gotta get on them right away. If it's an IT manager or an intern, maybe we wanna nurture them and we probably wanna nurture them with different content. So that's kind of the framework you want to set up, establish some theories, and then depending on that theory, you can start analyzing the conversion rates. And if, if there's a really low conversion rate, if you're passing leads to sales and they're closing 0.1% of them, well, you drew your line uh, too early, 
and you've got to take advantage of automation yeah. to push that line to the right. Versus if they're closing 50% of them, you probably um, sold yourself short and you should push that line to the left because you're leaving some money on the table. So that's kind of the framework that we went at it. Cool? Great, so, thanks. Yep. Got right. some reading to do. <laughs> Hi, Mark. Jillian Todd. I'm one of our um, sales account executives here. So I just went on my mobile phone to learn a little bit more about HubSpot. Yep. And um, I noticed that you guys are running SEM. Yep. So, and actually one of your competitors ad ahead of you guys is pretty interesting. It says, wait, check us out first. Who is <laughs> but, it? Um, Who is it? That was interesting. Who is um, it? Multi-touch leads. <laughs> okay. Interesting. So. So two questions yeah. for you. Yeah. So two questions for you. So first of all, I love... It sounds like you guys are obviously a very lead-driven um, company, which is very much the same yep. business model as a number of our clients. So I'd love to better understand how you think about Google and how and how we're driving leads for you, yes. how you assess value. Yep. Then the second question is something that we're challenged with with a lot of our clients is because they are so performance-driven and typically think of Google as being a low, just a low funnel acquisition tool. We're trying to help them think about our inventory um, a bit differently and to think about search as a branding and an upper funnel and mid funnel play as well. So would love to hear from you if you guys have thought about us yep. in that same fashion. Um, and if you haven't, what would resonate with you? So the second question is like, do we to get away from the pure click, lead, sale, and think more about brand awareness? Particularly when using search. Yes. So thinking about SEM, yeah. Paid upper, search, yeah. mid funnel. Yeah, yeah exactly. Okay. Yeah, um, so the first part is um, we've run a lot of experimentations, paid with you guys, with Facebook, et cetera, um, without you know, a ton of like, success relative to our other campaigns. And part of me feels it's like just kind of like, it would almost like um, contradict with our, with our mission. So I think there's a little bit of like a prejudice of like w the marketers that join us, and we're almost like rooting against the campaign in a way. Um, and I think part of it's actually like the team is just so good at content, and with the buyers that we're trying to reach being marketers, it's such an effective channel for us, right? So we have we've we've fairly invested a decent sum of money and actually hired uh, SEM experts to come in and, and do this stuff. And it's just not an enormous driver for us because of that unique context. Um, now, I will tell you um, that's a little bit different on the sales software with a different persona, and we lean into that. Um, we lean into that a bit, a bit more, both in like the PPC as well as the SEM as well as the uh, social media ads. Um, for us, there uh, in the in the uh, freemium model, we find that. Um, the more sophisticated the ad platform is, obviously, in terms of getting us down to the specific filters we need, that makes the world a difference at the volume that we're, you know, that we're doing. Like, for example, knowing what web browser they're coming from, you know, when, 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 these, uh, when these ad platforms can filter on that, which some can and some can't, um, that, that will drive like a huge ROI uh, for us. Uh, in terms of the branding piece, you know, for us, it's just you're, you're asking, like, I could probably answer it for us and then for our customers. Because for us, like, we're just such on one end of the spectrum of just drinking the Kool-Aid on inbound. Even, like, not just even questioning, like, uh, SEM driving our brand, but even just, like, PR. Like, how even bought in we are to that, as opposed to just being go, uh, going out there and building our own TV station, building our own radio platform, building our own you know, major conference and, and uh, uh, you know, trade magazine, et cetera. Um, that's just kind of like our, our notion. For our clients, it's tough. I mean, I just think like, again, you're, you're dealing with like me being a quant guy and I, we're from a quant company. Like, I, I just, I'm, I don't like things that I can't clearly measure. And I don't, I don't know, like I don't know enough about the branding stuff. You know, there's probably ways to measure like reach and all that kind of stuff and awareness. Um, but uh, I'm sorry, I don't have a, I don't have a more agreeable answer with you. But this, like, you're, if that's my honest truth, it's like I, I just not psyched about things that I can't clearly measure to, to lead flow and revenue. No, that sounds familiar. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Maybe one, one more question. Are we? Okay. It'll be, it'll be yeah, quick question, sorry, and then we'll be done. Um, so when you were talking about, uh, my name is Daniela, I'm an account hey, manager on the healthcare team. Cool. When you were talking about key attributes that uh, sort of 
went towards success. You mentioned yes. curiosity. Yes. So I'm curious. Yes. How do you mention? How do you measure curiosity? Yeah. Yeah. The whole interview process is outlined, I think, in chapter uh, four, three. But um, it starts with the opening when I walk in, greet you in the lobby. And if you're very awkward and like I have to ask questions of you, or if you've done your research and, and have a natural conversation, I like to start there. Then I do a role play at some point during the interview. And um, I just see, do you start by show up and throw up, as we call it in the industry, and give me a five minute elevator pitch on HubSpot? Or do you actually dive into why I downloaded the white paper and, and ask good follow on questions? That's really how I get my incentives. And that's my encouragement often, encouragement often to people who are getting into sales is as a sort of fun exercise on the side when you're out on a Friday night at a you know, wedding reception or, or a networking event. You know, meet people and see how long you can go asking them questions without them feeling interrogated or annoyed. <laughs> and um, you know, I, it's something that I just kind of do naturally. I enjoy it because, hey, I know about me. I don't know about you. And I'll literally have 20 minute conversations with people who, whenever they ask me a question, I deflect it and immediately go back to a question them. And they know nothing about me except my name. And they go off and talk to their wife and be like, that guy, Mark, he's a really great guy. And all I did was ask them a bunch of questions, but those questions made them think differently about the stuff they were thinking because they were asked so well and they were truly genuine and curious because I, I generally curious about what you're doing. So that's how I measure curiosity. Okay. Thanks for the time, guys. Appreciate being here.